Good evening. Yad a she a Sanya Bigay in a share. Twitch evening Michel, Hanagati Bushish team, Kiani Dushiche Dog, is a Hana Dushinella. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sanya Bigay, and I am an executive staff assistant with the Navajo Nation, the president and vice president. And I welcome you to this evening's virtual webinar. In honor of Navajo Nation Human Trafficking and Awareness Month, President Jonathan Nez, First Lady Fafilia Nez, Vice President Myron Lizer, and Second Lady Dottie Lizer signed a proclamation on January 11th to show support for survivors, victims, and advocates of human trafficking. The Navajo Nation Office of the First Lady and Second Lady, along with several partners, will host virtual webinars this month aimed at providing educational throughout the month of January. We invite all individuals to be a part of this important movement to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities. This evening, we will hear from Restoring Ancestral Winds, a nonprofit organization based out of Utah, whose mission is to support healing in indigenous communities. Restoring Ancestral Winds aims to advocate for healthy relationships, educate communities on issues surrounding stalking, domestic, sexual, dating, and family violence, collaborate with Great Basin community members and stakeholders, and honor and strengthen traditional values of all relations. Today's webinar will provide a preview of the types of trauma one can experience and provide a framework of healing from Diné scholars, healers, and knowledge holders. I thank Mr. Maroni Benali for delivering these important messages this evening. Looking forward, on Friday, January 21st, Matthew Holgate, a Navajo student of Vanguard University from Southern California, will provide a presentation on Human Trafficking 101, which is information with an emphasis on a message to Navajo youth. On Wednesday, January 26, we will hear from Thomas Alberti, Assistant United States Attorney and Tribal Liaison for the District of New Mexico. He will provide a session on combating human trafficking from a law enforcement perspective. On Friday, January 28th, the Navajo Nation Division of Public Safety will provide a virtual demonstration and provide safety and prevention tips. Again, these will all be virtual presentations that you can watch here on the Navajo Nation Office of the President and Vice President Facebook page, along as the Navajo Nation OPVP Communications YouTube channel. When we talk about human trafficking and violence against vulnerable populations, it is also important to talk about prevention. Prevention is the key to begin the healing and restoration of our Navajo people. This month, let us begin to ask ourselves, how can we protect each other and how can we build our communities to be safer? We can begin with personal safety and awareness. Being aware and implementing certain practices can make a difference in your life. We encourage you all to make personal safety your priority. And you can begin by being aware, being aware of your surroundings. Scan the area, whether you're in a parking lot, you're leaving home, but scan the area for suspicious persons, vehicles, and or activity. Be quick as you enter and exit your vehicle. Lock your doors as soon as you enter your vehicle. Do not travel alone if you, can, um, if you can avoid that. And especially don't travel at night if you don't have to. Trust your instinct. If you feel uncomfortable, leave right away and get help. Be involved. Take the initiative to know where and with whom your children are with at all times or even who they are communicating with online, social media. Stay connected. Periodically notify a trusted individual of your whereabouts and maintain healthy relationships with family and friends. 
And we all know technology is a big part of our lives. Uh, our phones have location uh, notifications, location services, and emergency signals. Get to know your phones or your um, electronic devices. They can come to your aid in some instances. You may also seek help. There are resources within the Navajo Nation programs uh, that you can access. So just be knowledgeable, start researching, look into a few of the Navajo Nation programs. And of course, be proactive, carry emergency supplies and or equipment, an extra blanket in your vehicle, a flashlight, batteries, jumper cables, and most importantly, do not disclose personal information, especially online. Screening your friends, um, making your profiles private, and just overall being careful with what information you share or what information your children share. So from the office of the First Lady and Second Lady, we will continue to be an advocate for healthy families and healthy communities. At the core, we have a focus on the home and family. And that includes home environments, marriage, parenting, and as well as holistic healing and rest restoring individuals and family units with a strong cultural and spiritual foundation. In addition, Office of the First Lady and Second Lady strives to highlight the work of Navajo Nation divisions and programs. It is through these partnerships with various programs and organizations that we have been able to host a variety of virtual events. We encourage you to visit our website at www.nnoflsl.com or download our mobile app, which can be downloaded on the Google Play Store or Apple Store. During the month of January, we encourage everyone to wear blue, which is an internationally recognized color to end human trafficking. We also encourage you to utilize hashtags on all your social media pages to wear, to raise awareness. Hashtag Inadilzen means that our lives are precious and sacred. And hashtag Haholne translates to resilience. These two important concepts are rooted in our Navajo way of life. We encourage you to take care of yourselves, your children and your families. Please check on your elders during the cold weather and continue to wear your mask and practice CDC guidelines. Again, I thank you for joining us this evening. And at this time, I will introduce our presenter from Restoring Ancestral Winds, Mr. Maroni Benali. Mr. Benali is the public policy and advocacy con consultant at Restoring Ancestral Winds Incorporated. He also serves as a board member of Western Resource Advocates, a con conservation organization that seeks to protect the West's land, air, and water to ensure that vibrant communities exist in balance with nature. Additionally, he serves as vice president of Dinah College. Prior to this, he taught at Evergreen State College in the Masters of Public Administration program. Mr. Benali has been with Restoring Ancestral Winds for four years now. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our presenter, Mr. Benali. Thank you. I had um, Sonia, although I had um, um, to the office of the president and vice president for making, um, making it possible to present this evening to you. Um, as was introduced already, um, I'll just adone egi e yaha, um, nashashin nishlido, but ani bashish chindo, tua hane dasha chedo, tabai dasha nava, although I is a total condent nasha. Um, I currently live in Sweetwater as well, although at e yaha, um, restoring ancestral winds, a banash nish as the public policy. A consultant and um, I've been with them for four years and I just again wanted to express my gratitude and to the office of the first lady and uh, to the president and vice president for all their efforts and 
uh, supporting uh, the work to end trafficking, to end gender-based violence across the Navajo Nation and to promote healing. Um, and that's, that, that is um, the, the one way that we can prevent further violence in its many forms upon our people is through uh, healing from all the trauma, the past, the present, and 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 as um, current scholars are are uh, explaining now, the anxiety about the future generations as well, and so healing from that trauma is a way that 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 can um, uh, really end trafficking. Um, but I wanted to go through just very quickly again to talk about restoring ancestral winds. Uh, incorporated, with, it, it's a tribal coalition, one of 18 tribal coalitions throughout the United States, funded uh, by the U.S. Department of Justice and through their Office of Violence Against Women. Uh, Restoring Ancestral Wind serves um, the federally, like, or federally recognized chapters and urban population, indigenous populations within the state of Utah and uh, the surrounding areas as well, and has been collaborating with different tribe coalitions around ending sexual <clears throat> and dating uh, violence, family violence, and violence in all of its forms, as we're finding out. And so, um, so Restoring Answers Winds has been doing that for the last six years and has um, made incredible strides in terms of the murdered, missing Indigenous women, the uh, um, uh, issues in the state, as well as to bring attention to a number of other critical issues that our people face um, within this uh, <clears throat> uh, within this context. Um, but I wanted just to talk just briefly about. See, we have uh, <clears throat> all on the same page with with trafficking and and what it what it is and what it means. Um, <clears throat> so trafficking is essentially. Um, it's a modern day form of, of, of servitude. In other words, forced coerced labor of some sort where individuals will be able to control and, 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 and force those that, that receive money for their labor to take that money away from them. Um, it's an incredibly highly profitable global enterprise that generates billions of dollars um, every year. And a lot of that is, um, it, it's found in multiple different sectors and operates according to the dyna dynamics of supply and demand. And so th there are, there are um, associations of increased trafficking of women, girls, and children, um, sometimes young, young adult males as well um, during our fair, during the times when there's a, our, our fair times in different areas of the reservation, Navajo Nation, there are different forms of, of trafficking that have been observed in some of the areas where um, there is uh, a lot of construction and also uh, around areas where there's mining and drilling as well. And so there, there are different um, supply and demand dynamics around human trafficking. But in the end, what trafficking is, is really about um, it's about um, exploiting victims and having control over them. Um, and so, so what we see under federal law um, is that a federal law governs um, uh, commercial sex acts under with those that are minors. Uh, it regulates that with adults um, and anyone who is forced or frauded or coerced into different forms of labor services, different um, forms of uh, commercial sex acts. Um, and, and also this other one of, of just going into, into debt bondage using human, human labor, which is the, the last one to, to, to basically pay um, to, to get a service from someone. And so you, you're, you're in bondage to them in a different way. <laughs> And so the Navajo Nation itself has uh, standing human trafficking laws under uh, sec Title 17 of the Navajo Nation Code. And it's very explicit in terms of what human trafficking is um, about recruiting, soliciting, enticing, transporting, obtaining by any, any means another person with the intent 
um, or knowledge that to, to uh, that force, fraud, coercion will be used to subject someone else. And so we have these laws in the Navajo Nation that are um, th that have recently been um, uh, added to Navajo Nation law in order to protect us, our Navajo people, from trafficking. Because one of the one of the trafficking routes um, across the entire continent comes right through the Navajo Nation. And so uh, in terms of uh, a trafficking um, uh, road, road, if you will, uh, the Navajo Nation is, 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 a, is a destination on, on that route. And so necess necessitated having human trafficking laws so we can protect our people and prosecute those that choose to disrupt or, and bring disorder and imbalance into our communities. And so, so, so some of these venues, what do they look like? A lot of them right now are, are turning into social online where you can, folks will uh, use uh, social networks like Facebook or Snapchat or TikTok or whatever else to find individuals, even in the middle of the reservation where there's internet and will find ways to exploit, exploit them, especially if they're minors, uh, trafficking in and child pornography and those types of images. And those are part and parcel of just trafficking in general. And then in border towns, you, you see these fake massage or business parlors across that have a commercial front, but they're, they, they, they use a number of, of young, young people that are coerced into doing very uh, highly sexual and erotic types of massages in those, in those um, in those commercial settings, like in Farmington, you see a number of these massage parlor parlors there. Um, and, and it's sort of just the same as you go all the way down in terms of, of residential-based commercial sex. We, we've, there are some anecdotes or stories about how this could happen in some places like the NHA neighborhoods that we have across the Navajo Nation. Um, in high tourist season, the hotel and motels become a, a point of interest for trafficking. Um, I know that there are border border towns as well that are using our people in these strip clubs, and and it just keeps going going on different types of venues of where you can find trafficking. But it's not only that. Sometimes we find tra trafficking in our own home community, in our in our own extended family networks as well. Um, and so this is where we we get into this the, this this idea of of trauma and what is trauma. So people who are trafficked are harmed in some way. They, they have a traumatic moment where they, they are disrupted or they're put into imbalance. And so we hear this type of imbalance coming out of all of these different terms that we hear. Uh, there's trauma informed, which is like, which is understanding how that imbalance occurred, what can keep triggering that imbalance and how to heal that imbalance. There's traumatic stress of, well, there are different situations and conditions or phrases or words or pictures where it will remind an individual about a specific type of traumatic moment and cause stress. And that impacts how our brain works and the chemicals and it, it, it leads to uh, oftentimes people making impulsive decisions that they otherwise wouldn't. And so we, all of these different types of trauma are sort of organized around this idea of having there being some sort of disruption that happened in, in the healthy, in what was supposed to be the healthy growing years of an individual. Um, and so, so what does this mean? So we have the, uh, the the um, the DSM five, which is a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which all um, license mental health professionals and others uh, working within um, within healthcare uh, know, and this is how they define trauma: it results from an event like being trafficked as a child or older. Or, or witnessing forms of trafficking, or ser series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced, excuse me, by an individual as physically and emotionally harmful or threatening, or that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning, physical, social, 
uh, emotional and spiritual well-being. And so what we find is that trauma um, <clears throat> happens when someone is, is exposed to some form of this type of violence um, that, that can cause serious harm. And as we know that when we start thinking about our Denehwe of being, our, our, our thoughts, our nsahakes, nsahakes, it, it, gets, it, it gets impacted. And so there's a scholar, Dr. Herbert Benali, who wrote about how the, the, because we're Deneh and we have a relationship with Mother Earth, that means that we have to, there has to be a way to explain how that relationship um, is organized. And he, and, and he wrote in, in drawing on um, 40 years of his own work on this, he, he writes, Mother Earth's placement of the four great branches of knowledge is not arbitrary. They relate directly to a person's basic constitution of thought, body, mind, and home place. Hence, a person is not independent, but integrally connected to their environment. And so when, when one of these gets disrupted through trauma, we then begin to, to see that there is an imbalance that happens and it has ripple effects, um, not only for the individual and their, their immediate home, but to their extended family, their community, and so on. And again, this getting back to that, these these individual parts of of, of what um, Navajo scholars have called our our uh, constitution, nsahakes, our thoughts, nihiatsis, our bodies, our mind, and in, in the Navajo, anne is is also a synonym for family. And then our whole one, our home place, and and that gets turned into what what these are called. Um, the, these parts are the parts of the day that Mother Earth put into action, and so you then see those parts of the day are in balance and aligned with the parts of our of our body and our constitution. And so trauma disrupts those, and it makes it hard for us to see how the others are interrelated. And so if there's trafficking that's happening at a community level, it impacts the way the community thinks about themselves and about others and about the individual. And so, so a, a lot of this, we can see there's different types of trauma. There's individual trauma that we can get uh, that's also called contemporary trauma. That's basically if you're a victim or, or witness, just even witnessed and watching it unfold between your brothers, your sisters, your nephews, your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, your community. If you witness domestic violence, sexual violence of some sort, even if you're just a witness, it impacts you. And you have this, this what they call this contemporary individual trauma. And then especially it impacts those uh, that are the, the direct victims uh, more, more, <clears throat> more deeply. And then you have other issues like complex trauma, like what we've all experienced and still experienced with, with a lot of these public health orders of what we ought to do and, and the massive uh, fatalities and, and uh, anxieties that we've all felt as a result of this pandemic. That is a series of events, including not being able to get simple things like, like uh, Clorox wiping to, to clean our homes, those are all part and parcel of what scholars would call complex trauma. And so we're feeling that as well as a nation. And then there's other types of trauma that just sort of, we, 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 it feels like we inherit them, but we inherit them in different ways, either directly through our family. And this they call historic, historical trauma. If you, any of you watched the most recent Disney film, Encanto, uh, it really describes um, in, in this cartoon uh, movie what intergenerational or historical trauma does to families. Um, and, and part of this historical trauma that we're feeling is, not, is, is about this long past that we've had where we've not fully been able all of as a nation to fully grieve the loss of land, our traditional spiritual ways, we've lost a sense of self, our understanding of what self-respect means at times. Um, the historical trauma cuts different ties and this trauma that happens historically 
can sort of ripple. So let's say that we have a, an, a, one of our grandparents or their parents who were a victim of some terrible violent event that happened or, or, they, or they were in the boarding school and got trafficked in boarding school. Those, those types of traumas tend to ripple and, and impact future generations. And so if we take a look at this Navajo traditional way of thinking, we, we begin to see that trauma impacts all these different areas. It impacts the way we think, it impacts even our bodies at times. Our bodies get very tense. Sometimes we feel a deep sense of loss, like a hole inside of us, or our, our bodies will, will be uh, um, responding in very different ways uh, about very simple situations or even sometimes even just a color. And so our trauma impacts that. It also impacts the way we interact with our families. If something really bad happened to us, we may be afraid to tell them because we're, we're afraid that they might not love us anymore or that we're afraid that, 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 that they'll blame us for what happened. Um, it affects our home place. Sometimes we get traumatized or we're leaving these moments of trafficking and it feels like it's such a huge effort just to clean your home, to fix your bed in the morning, to brush your teeth, um, to keep your home clean. Trauma impacts that and it makes it very difficult to do simple things like that. And so when we think about shifting back into how our Diné people used to think, we, we had this idea of Diné Ergo. It's like, what's our place in the world? Yeah. And we think about she as a pronoun. It immediately includes our fire, all of these things, our, our, our land. Um, it includes our mountains, our relatives, our community. When we say she in Navajo in those contexts, that's what it immediately means. But over time, as we've interacted with, um, with our, our good white brothers and sisters and, and others that have come through and we've adopted their language, um, that has, be, has created oftentimes a traumatic response in a lot of people because then we start thinking that, that, that I is this very personal disconnected person where everything is just focused on me, my thoughts, my property, my feelings, my emotions, my body. And so when we start then thinking about how do we heal when someone is thinking about going, is using a way of using that context of thinking, how do, how do you bring them away from uh, um, a situation that is harmful um, and, and they're not able to see. And so part of that, I want to just sort of illustrate in the, in the, in the last um, uh, 10 minutes using uh, a, a, a story of, uh, of Ashki or Ashki, as people would say these days. Um, this is more of a composite of people's different stories. And I just wanted to illustrate. So so, so Ashki is 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 Tapa. Huh? He's born for Tohana. Uh, his che is Hashkishniado, but Naligi e Todichini. And so we we want to hear what his story is using this Navajo framework of saying the, this is how stories are passed on. So we take Ashki's Nali, who is Todichini. Um, probably um, in his 70s or 80s, probably right now. If we take his story, he's the last of 11. He grew up in a home where he, he never went to school, but his dad was a farmer, but wasn't really successful because he drank a lot. His mother tried to weave, but she drank a lot. They both fought with each other in front of him, in front of the community, um, in front of the family. The aunties and uncles and cousins would come over and they would drink and they would fight in front of each other. I don't know who among them, but they passed Ashki around and he was physically and sexually abused between the ages of three and 12. And then they threw the responsibility on him when he was six and seven years old to take care of the younger ones while they drank. 
And he decided in his early years that he would run away to boarding school because it was a way to escape only to be introduced to a whole number of other issues in boarding schools. But one thing that we know from, from Ashkey's story is, is that his, his elders, at least in his family, they told stories of being taken from their land, from their livelihood being stolen, their land fenced off by government officials, their sheep massacred, and all these things that happened to them. At the same time, they're acting out in these different ways. And so when we think about the types of trauma, this is the type of trauma that we're talking about, historical trauma. This is how it manifests. This is what it looks like. His trauma is not a thought. It's a response to a behavior. It's a, it's a behavioral response to some event or action. So we see this happening with Ashkey's Nully. And then we then look at Ashkey's chain. Sort of a different story, Hashkishni. He's the first of three children. He's a, he was a, he's a rancher and he managed a local trading post. His mom worked in the dormitory. His aunties, uncles, and cousins would come together regularly for family gatherings. And they all supported him and his uh, uh, brothers and sisters and others to go, to go to school and get education they need. But with them, they rarely talked about what happened to their community. Rather, they focused on adopting the modern way as a way for happiness for, for their family. And then we think about Ashki's father, who is Tohana and how he grew up. He's the middle of nine children, dropped out of high school um, and college. Others uh, in his family dropped out of high school and college. And he fights a lot with his brothers and sisters and argues with them over all different things about who takes care of the family, who takes care of the land, who takes care of the sheep. He goes off to school and gets a college degree. And then he comes back, he gets married, but's distant from his wife. He gets divorced. He gets then becomes more distance with his children. And then after work, he drinks a lot, but he somehow maintains his job. And it, when no one's looking and no one knows that he's depressed, he's suicidal, it just doesn't, but he doesn't let anyone know. He's just surviving. And this is, this is Ashki's father. And then we look at Ashki himself. He was sexually abused and it, by his extended family between the ages of three and six. At times, his fa extended family members sold him to strangers when he was a child. He was physically abused by family and extended family. He was shoved, pushed, slapped, kicked, choked, made fun of. When he was 13, his older brother gets sent to prison for homicide. By that time, he's so tired of being there, he runs away because this, this older person in Gallup says that he can provide a place, a, a place of safety for him. And he ends up going to Gallup and he's full physically coerced into becoming um, into sex trafficking in and around Gallup and Farmington area. And he does that till he's 21. Finally, he decides that he needs to seek help. And on his own, he goes online and tries to find a, a way to just finish high school. And he does so, and then he ends up going to college and graduate school. But even all of this time, He's feeling lost and depressed and angry. He's withdrawn. He's unmotivated. He gets very angry quickly and he drinks a lot. And then he, he knows something's wrong with him. So he starts seeing a therapist who, uh, who tells him that he needs to heal his past. But despite that, he's still sad and then ends up in, in a suicide watch. When he comes out of that, he's estranged from his family and his community. And he tries his best to heal, but isn't having success. When we think about, when we think about Ashki's story, it's more than just his individual actions. It wasn't his fault that he went into trafficking, but now he has to do with the trauma of having been trafficked as a child. He has to do with the trauma that was passed down by his father and his grandfathers, the expectations they have 
uh, for him and what he needs to do when he's still in so much darkness. And so he's trying to heal. And so he has this history of trafficking and violence within his family, lots of substance abuse, physical and verbal and emotional abuse happening to, to them as both minors and both as grown adults. And so we start thinking about this and how trafficking impacts every part of this, this, this way of thinking that is to bring us uh, a state of hojon and, and peace. And so we, we talk about healing and how healing um, is, is such a, an, an interrelated process that our, just our self, our thoughts, our body, um, our rights becomes a disrupting barrier to being able to connect with our community, our thoughts, our bodies, our minds. And that's necessary to start healing how policy is made in response to these issues. And so, so this, is, this, is, this is how our traditional wisdom has taught us of how we can heal. And more so, it, it, it becomes a diagnostic tool to help determine what is going on and, and what can we do about it. Um, and so one of the ceremonial songs in Navajo um, is a song, um, uh, according to the prayer, White Corn Boy, who is a god, he calls out for the person who is lost, who's been disrupted and is living in a state of disorder and imbalance, and sings after them. And so after he hears nothing, that spiritual being, White Corn Boy, who is this um, deity who cares about, uh, symbolically goes out to find him and rescue him. And when he finds the person confined in the home of this old spirit, evil spirit, white corn boy, then um, uh, tells the, the patient, he's like, we are going home. And then does something incredible. He turns him shabak echo, turning him sunrise, sunwise. And that is a, is a symbol of restoring and reawakening of an individual to their moral obligations of, of to themselves, to others, of walking or remaining in this path of the blessing way, is what they call it. It's a metaphor for bringing the missing person and the absent mind home. And so when we think about that, how do we do that? Our own, our own stories, and, and I've heard many Diné scholars say our own healthcare system meaning that our ceremonial system has a way to bring balance and harmony back into those areas that are disharmed. And so we can take example from the story of, of when first man was trying to get connected um, way back when with a changing woman. And he ascends each time from different parts of the mountain, but is only able to get so far. And so and so we, we connect that with he, that um, changing one's only able to see the healed thoughts from this person who is, who is ascending um, in, to the mountain to see her. And then um, in the South, the body comes into view. And this is where a lot of that complex trauma happens um, as well, because it includes our heart and our hands where we are able to do all types of work and that's the half body of, of the first man ascending from the south side to, to get connected with changing women. And then from, from, from the west uh, comes almost completely within view. And that's about you're able then to see that person as the ne, and that immediately invokes all of those others the, of the people who they are. And so healing from that historical trauma, changing women's then able to see them as they are. Um, and then that last part of uh, uh, 
he's fully in, in reverence of, of, of what is what has taken place and in, in reverence of of the pain that they went through and recognizing that it has become a teacher for them. And they ascend that last portion of, of the north and they're completely in view. And they enter into a space where there's empowerment and harmonious living between uh, those first deities. And so this then leads to reclaiming these values and visibility. They talk about having regained their mind, which in Navajo, again, is a synonym for family. Yellow curl, corn girl carries the mind of the lost person and takes their position behind them, meaning that carrying the entire, symbolically carrying the family behind the patient. And then healing occurs when the person then resumes their responsibility and position in the family. And that's, again, where they're able to then reestablish relations and respect those relations um, within themselves and, and, and with, the, with, with the entire universe. And so at that point, we then start thinking that this is the path that our, that our Che's and Masan has laid out for us of a way back of healing, a way back of returning to, to goodness and, and compassion. is what they say. And that really is the healing process that, that we know best that, that works uh, with our people, the more that we are able to help them find connection to larger relations and help them remember their place in them, the more, they, the more they're able to heal from, from situations like trafficking if they were victims, but also for them to be able to find ways to um, identify when it's happening and do their obligation under Kehwinzen to then find a way to eliminate that, that monster that is in their midst. midst. So thank you. Um, we can take questions now. Yeah. Yes, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Good evening, and thank you, Mr. Benali, for your presentation. At this time, if you have any questions, we do have some time for a quick question and answer portion. So if you have questions and you're watching online um, on the Facebook page, you can leave a question as well as the YouTube page. We do have staff standing by monitoring those comments. Um, and while we're waiting for any questions to come through, I just want to thank Restoring Ancestral Winds for being our presenter this evening. And as I stated earlier, the Office of the First Lady and Second Lady will host a variety of other presentations the next two weeks to close out January. And so just to share some additional information, we're going to pull up our flyer to show the dates for the um, upcoming presentations. And so, as you can see on your screen, January 19th, which is this evening, is our presentation from Restoring Ancestral Winds. January 21st, this Friday, we will have Matthew Holgate, and he's a Navajo student attending Vanguard University. He will provide um, human trafficking 101 um, general information as well as a message to youth. Next week, January 26 on Wednesday, Thomas Alberti from the New Mexico U.S. Attorney's Office will present on combating human trafficking from a law enforcement perspective. And we will close out the month of January on the 28th with a self-defense demonstration from the Navajo Nation Division of Public Safety. And so again, we just encourage you all to wear blue for the month of January to show support, as well as utilizing um, our hashtags on social media uh, to raise, raise awareness. 
In addition, we also encourage you to download the Navajo Nation Office of the First Lady and Second Lady mobile app. You can download that now on the Apple Store or at the Google Play Store. And again, we just like to say thank you to Mr. Benali, as well as his colleague uh, Yolanda Francisco Nez for being our partner and working with us to provide this informative session. Again, um, this is a very lengthy topic, can be a lengthy topic. And so we know that there's a lot that we cannot cover in a short amount of time. And so our hope is that it begins the conversation for you. Um, it's a conversation starter and that we take bits here and there and start to implement those in our daily lives. Again, it all goes back to keeping ourselves safe as well as our families. And that's our, that's our main goal is to promote healthy and strong families uh, which eventually lead to healthy and stronger communities as a whole. And um, so again, we just encourage everyone to be proactive, um, be aware. Awareness and steps to prevention are key and can really keep you safe um, when you're out and about in your communities, out in the border towns. And so Thank you again for joining us. I will turn the time back over. Do we have any questions? Uh, Maroni, I do have a question. And I'm not sure um, you can be able to answer. Uh, can you explain the connection between mind and family? Um, well, I, I don't know. Um, that's like asking what's connection between hard and difficult. Um, in Navajo, Anne is located within your heart. And in Navajo, traditional just knows that those are connected to family. That's just known. So if you want a full extended philosophical conversation about that, I'm sure there's others that, that are more, um, that have more expert level knowledge about that. But just in terms of mind and family, that that's just the location of family is, is your unknit, which is also your heart. And the heart is also a word for mind which is also a synonym for family. And so I guess, uh, yeah, I, I yeah, that, that's about it. But if you want more on that, I can certainly give you um, individuals who could speak to that in more depth. Okay, another question. What words can be used to begin healing? I guess what, what words could start a conversation? How, what can be a conversation starter? I think, I think it's a combination of a couple of things. Um, being able to sit with them and not judge mm -hmm. their actions, not judge their pain, not shame them for what they've done and being able to let them know that that is where you are first and then saying she yasha in navajo that 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 is the ultimate form of connection there are plenty of blessing way songs where they talk about uh calling us she yasha she yasha and so starting with those words of in is how I, I firmly believe that one is able to feel the connection and the power of the prayers when you're able to use in, And they'll be able to feel the relationship and the power of that 
relationship you have with, with them. And that begins the process in my mind of them taking the step to heal. And so using kind words, those are the words that you ought to be using. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. That was a great answer. Um, we have one question. I'm not too sure how um, informed you are um, of the schools, but the question is, do you know of any effective school-based trauma-informed teaching practices that have been implemented in any schools? Um, I, I don't know about the effective part, but I know a number of school districts and um, uh, the, the, the state's school boards as well are have been working in, in the three states that Navajo Nation is in, are, are aware of trauma-informed practices. And, and I think some schools have had training on how to use trauma-informed trauma -informed teaching practices, but off the top of my head, I can't say there's one school or another that is effective just because it's been um, uh, recently introduced. And so we, we don't quite um, have the, uh, the outcomes of, of those individual programs yet. But I, I do know that there is, there is effort in having more trauma-informed teaching uh, within schools. I apologize, I didn't answer your question fully, but that's as much as I know. Thank you for that. And one final question. Can you provide your contact information for those who might have questions? Um, Yes, so we will be sharing, um, I think um, um, my executive director Yolanda um, will be okay with this. We're, we'll, we'll share the, the slides on our website mm -hmm. and it'll have contact informa information uh, for me on, their, on the website as well. So they can reach me through there. Thank you again, Mr. Benali, and thank you to Ancest uh, Restoring Ancestral Winds. Um, thank you for the partnership that has allowed for us to provide this information to the people of the Navajo Nation. And again, from the Office of the First Lady and Second Lady, I do encourage you to tune in again uh, Friday and next week, Wednesday and Friday, for the presentations that will carry us through the month of January. The um, information is posted on our mobile app, as well as Office of the President and Vice President social media pages. So with that, we will end tonight's presentation. Please take care of yourself. Uh, travel safely if you will be traveling this evening. And of course, wear your mask and continue to follow CDC guidelines. Ahihat. <laughs>